Thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful crowd. Uh, I do have to confess, I am not a morning person. And I have, I'm creative, but I'm, I'm much more of an afternoon creative. Uh, but uh, I do have a, a three-year-old that wakes me up at 6.30 every day. And I work from home, though. So I'm usually in my pajamas until 12.30 doing my work, sketching. Um, so thank you for getting me out of bed making me look professional, um, and I think it's gonna be a great way to start the day. So I'm excited to share uh, my work with you, and I'm also excited um, that when I was asked to speak, uh, I had the opportunity to, to come and speak, I was excited uh, with the, uh, for the possibility to speak on justice. I saw this was one of, one of the words. And justice is so intrinsically tied to editorial cartooning, and it may not be as obvious to everybody, but. There's, there's so many levels that justice is tied to editorial cartooning. So let me first pull up the one slide here. In a broad sense, editorial cartooning, if, I'm not sure how familiar you are with political cartoons or what I do, but in a very, the broadest sense, cartooning is a pure form of free expression. Um, it's, a, it's a tradition that we've had since the beginning in America and, and before in Europe. And a cartoon that uses satire to, to to ridicule and skewer those in power and speak truth to power. We can get away with, in a cartoon, more so than arguably in anything else because it's a protected form of free speech under our Constitution. So this, this essential free speech, we, won't have, we don't have justice without free speech. So the, the cartoon I have here, it says, if speech is free, why can't I afford it? And we've recently had a Supreme Court decision that equates speech to money and gives more power to those, more speech to those who have more money. And if as an individual, each of you, if we don't have the guaranteed right to speak out in a voice, a strong voice, we cannot speak out against injustice and we cannot create a just world. So in the broad sense, without free expression, we don't have, we don't have justice. But more narrowly, um, cartoons over the years have been a part of actually bringing actual legal justice to, to certain people in power um, in, in small communities and in a larger sense. And uh, famously on the left, Boss Tweed, one of the most early famous American cartoonists, uh, Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast was hugely successful, mythically powerful um, cartoonist in the mid 1800s um, in America. And Thomas Nast had a nasty skewering caricature of Boss Tweed, who was this corrupt politician. And the story goes that um, not only did his cartoons like, spread the word of his corruption to the masses, but he was identified when Boss Tweed fled America, he was identified in Europe by somebody that had recognized him from his cartoons. So he, he, he pointed him out and he was arrested and rumor has it um, Boss Tweed had Thomas Ness cartoons in his possession, like, <laughs> like just collecting them. Um, I'm not, you can't prove that that's true, but it just it, it speaks to the power of the editorial cartoon in bringing justice. Uh, and then you, 100 years later in the mid 1900s, you have uh, Richard Nixon, um, Herb Locke, one of the most legendary political cartoonists for the Washington Post. He was, Richard Nixon was famously sensitive to Herb Locke's caricatures and uh, the, you know, how we made him, showed how corrupt he was and he was always sensitive to the five o'clock shadow he gave him. But he, he was even quoted as to say like, I need to erase the Herb Locke image um, that Nixon had. So cartoons have been you know, fundamental in terms of you know, a, a role in American justice. Um, so for me, I have a guiding mantra in my work. Um, you know, every cartoonist is sort of, it's a, it's a writing job. And after five or six years um, doing the work, I, I tried to get sort of a guiding force. And for me, um, the old journalistic adage of comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable is sort of my lens with how I view how I should approach my work. And if there's an issue that I'm reading about, you know, I ask myself, like, you know, is someone afflicted here? Is someone, you know, should I, should I be afflicting somebody? And in many ways, um, over the years, justice as an idea has been the afflicted or justice to those who are um, you know, less fortunate or those who are oppressed, th th that is, you know, who, who is afflicted. 
So as you know, in editorial cartoons, everything is a symbol and you have Lady Justice literally shows up in cartoons as a symbol, Lady Justice. So I was gonna fly through a few examples how over the years uh, I, I can treat Lady Justice a little differently. Here, you just have her arm sticking out of an alligator's mouth. Um, but this is in 2013, the Stand Your Ground laws after Trayvon Martin was shot. Um, you know, that was an, a, an affront on justice. Um, fast forward to a similar police, or a similar issue in terms of um, you know, civil rights. Uh, you have Eric Gardner's case. Most recently, um, William Barr the, uh, in the Justice Department basically dropped all charges. So I have him suffocating Lady Justice, saying I, she's thinking I can't breathe, the famous words that Eric Gardner had. Um, and then you have the President of the United States skirting the rule of law and Lady Justice herself um, by using a presidential escape hatch. Um, to avoid uh, any kind of prosecution for obstructing justice, and you know, and so on. We have more, more Lady Justice. So as you see, Lady Justice shows up often in these cartoons. Um, but back to sort of my guiding force, and speaking of another issue that, that came up recently in El Paso with, with mass shootings, mass shootings and, and um, you know, the gun issue in, Uni in the United States, that has become a massive, um, point of inspiration for me in terms of defending, um, you know, comforting the afflicted. Talk about an injustice in our society that we need to keep speaking out until we get change. So, you know, I, I have different ways to approach the same kind of issue. I, in some cartoons, the concept here is holding pattern, and I have, you know, I kind of hit the afflicted and I comfort, I comfort the afflicted and I afflict the comfortable. I have the NRA money being clutched by Congress in the middle, I have an AR-15 being clutched by gun fanatics, but then I have a, a mother of a gun victim clutching the grave. And it's this holding pattern that keeps repeating and repeating. Um, and this, the next cartoon I have this sort of um, Uncle Sam character with, with a, young, a young boy looking over a giant massive grave saying, someday son, this will all be yours. And the graves are sh mass shooting victims, race wars, and so my, one of my, remind myself every day that our young people and our next generation, that's who we need to fight for when it comes to equality and justice. So that mantra though, really cuts across many different issues. Um, the environment, uh, human rights, um, climate change. So this is an example in climate change where we are systematically gassing um, all of these endangered species. And you know, so injustice comes in different forms. And speaking on terms of, uh, in terms of gassing, uh, I try to, as much as I can, s focus on local issues. And in the age of Trump right now, this is really a, a, a bit of a problem. Here I have um, the Tonawanda Coke, which is, a, which is a great local issue, a, a positive story that we ended up, our, you know, our community worked to shut this down. Um, and the, the people at the Clean Air Coalition did an, an amazing job but I just have sort of, you know, a kid with, with, with asthma and the caption is breathing a little easier. You know, we're, we're fighting for clean air. We're fighting for, for fairness. Um, but again, I'm thinking of the young people in our society. Um, but this local cartoon illustrates, I wanted to put this in here. I wish I could put more in my presentation, but right now, the one challenge in what I do is how many injustices, how many inequalities, how many wrongdoings are out there, every week the challenge is what to cover. And it's like drinking from a fire hose in a way. It's really, it's kind of, it's daunting. And um, I think the guiding force should be, you know, what affects our community the most and what is most important to speak out against. So uh, I want to speak a little bit about my path and how I got to editorial cartooning. So I brought up this cartoon, which, again, on the theme of, of my guiding force here, um, this is, if you, you can't make it out, there are ch migrant children in, caged in the grill of the Statue of Liberty. And you know, this, I think, is our greatest, one of our greatest humanitarian issues of our day right now. Um, but when I was about the age of those children, um, you know, whether it was five or six, that's when I, was forming these fundamental things in my, in, in my path that led me to here. That's why this is so important that we do something about this. 
you know, five and six years old, that is when you are on a path to go somewhere and do something and you form ideas and you form trauma. So when I was five or six, I was blessed um, with a you know, privileged family and I, I loved to draw. My parents gave me all these, these art books and I developed a full cast of, of characters, of, um, actually of Madagascar monkeys. And I, I just started learning about narrative and storytelling. And I think that in combination with the fact that I was, was just instilled with a strong moral compass, I think those are the two key things to, to be a good journalist, or to, uh, as a real cartoonist anyway. You have to have an interest in art, but you need a strong moral compass uh, to have a voice. So um, I, I grew up thinking though that art was a hobby and creative, creative work can be fun, but I, have a, I had a nurse for a mom and a mason for a dad. So, I should do something practical. So I, like a, good, like a good kid, I kept drawing for fun, but I, I studied hard and I was interested in computer science and math. And I thought I would go into computer graphics to combine both sides of my brain and satisfy that critical thinking need that I had and the creative outlet. But it turns out um, computer graphics, software engineering or coding, you're just like one small wheel in this giant machine um, you know, you might cr create the code, write the code to just, you know, do one little piece of something that renders, you know, clothing or whatever. So I just felt like powerless in a way. And at, at the same time, I joined the, the, the newspaper at Canisius College, the Griffin. And I was given this four by five inch space where I could say or do whatever I wanted. And it was, it was w w power in a way, and, and it came with responsibility. I learned that if I went too far, I would hear it, you know? Um, and if I made an impact or if I you know, struck a nerve, I would also hear that and see the dialogue and the debate and the power of having a voice and free expression. So I fell in love with that, with that concept. And so I wrote my, my honors thesis on cartooning and decided to abandon computer science for now, and it, it worked out pretty well. I got an internship in the Buffalo News, and the years after I got hired uh, for the, at the Buffalo News, it hit me that my experience at Canisius that instilled this Jesuit mindset, uh, this Jesuit school ethos of, of empathy and, you know, and, and thinking about those who are less fortunate, that has become like instilled with my outlook and my, my approach to my work. Um, human rights, um, social justice. So here I have um, Donald Trump meeting with Kim Jong-un in the famous photo, um, you know, trampling over, over human rights in his meeting. Now, national politics, that's what hooked me into political cartooning. When I was drawing at the Griffin, I, I was drawing on social issues on campus, and it was, it was, it was great. You know, I would, I would comment on, on, on different dynamics, but 9-11 happened, after 9-11, I got sucked into um, just history and, and national politics and foreign policy. Uh, so that was really what hooked me into political cartooning in the first place. So I'd like to spend a few minutes now just speaking about my creative process. And I will have a few minutes at the end to take questions, um, but I wanted to bring up this one because this kind of has a lot packed into it. It's a recent cartoon I did on, actually it was just a cartoon that I was doing on President Trump and his, and his statements and his comments on Twitter. So I have the president with a giant chum bucket. This is mega chum with all this fish and Twitter, Twitter birds and all kinds of nasty stuff. He's dumping it over the deck and creating a feeding frenzy of sharks. But the shark fins are, are KKK hoods that represent white nationalism. Um, so, and this was a few days before uh, the El Paso shootings. And the odd thing about my work is one of the challenges about the process is I work throughout the day for a deadline that's the following day. And sometimes I work for a deadline that's three or four days away on an issue that may change. And there's time, so I have to try to be a prognosticator and I would have to predict how is this going to read in, in three or four days. In the age of Trump, we're consuming news in minutes. So, you know, often I'm posting my, my work as soon as, I, as soon as I finish now, um, and I want to do that more. But, in this case, it was a comment on the president's racist remarks and uh, on Twitter and his, his blatant racism um, that has been stirring the pot and inspiring the darkest corners of our society. And, and this is, this is a, a massive problem that we're gonna have to deal with for years even after he's out of office. 
And then it just turned out the manifesto from the El Paso shooter was citing some of Donald Trump's language in terms of the invasions coming. So all of a sudden, this cartoon took on a new relevance and, and, and it became, so the timing of that became, became actually sadly good for the cartoon. But my process to create a, a cartoon like this is to, like I said, start working from home in my pajamas. Um, I, I read tons of, tons of news, I'm constantly consuming news, but you can think of the job of a cartoonist in three different parts or in three different roles. Um, the cartoon has a message that a journalist will, 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 will take, uh, strictly what is it saying? Uh, what is the opinion? And then there's a creative concept, you know, in this case, this feeding frenzy shark week. Um, kind of kind of metaphor. Usually, it's a visual metaphor, or or it's a story, and and then the third component is strictly the illustration. So, um, the challenge is I'm a little bit my own boss. You know, from a creative standpoint, I wake up with a blank canvas, and I need to create something completely from scratch that has my own voice in it and has um, you know an an executed illustration at the same time. So if you think of it in three parts, I'm just start by reading and developing that message. What do I want to comment on? Really, you know, kind of filtering out the news. Um, and then I, from there, I figure out what is most important and then I just brainstorm. And this, any creatives out there can relate, it's almost a job that's similar to a copywriter at an ad agency. Um, and for me, it's a lot of walking around, um, you know, I do some kind of, I search images, um, I have different creative techniques. Um, sometimes I think of ideas though in random places like driving or in the shower, so I'm always making notes um, when they strike me. And then, so between like noon and two o'clock, I craft this, these sketches of whatever I'm gonna create. And from there, um, I basically, my, I, I show my editor, either text him a copy or I'll, I'll walk to my editor's office and I will illustrate the final product, scan it two ways um, so that I can scan it in color for the syndicate. I upload it to the syndicate and, th and that appears in papers around the country. And then for the Buffalo News, I do just like a black and white line art version. And from there, that's like four o'clock, my day's not over. Then I'm, I'm reacting to uh, my, my readers on Twitter, on email. And for me, um, uh, on the process, I wanted to speak one more thing to the process. First of all, I want to, I, str I strive every day to comment on something that might not be Donald Trump related, <laughs> to give myself a break. So here we have the FIFA's woman, uh, the, the Women's World Cup trophy and their pay and, and the corresponding pay. So here I wanted to just illustrate that my goal as a, as a, as a creative is to always come up with a visual solution, whether it's like a juxtaposition of images, um, and speak to have my voice heard through through the visuals. So that's sort of my philosophy as an actual, you know, as an illustrator and as a cartoonist. Um, so something like this though will take maybe two to three hours from start to finish. So most of like from color and everything. Uh, this one might be more like one and a half, but anywhere from one and a half to three hours to create the work. Um, but I'm, it's not really a drawing job. It's a job that. I, I express a voice. Drawing has just become sort of second nature as part of it, it's just sort of my medium. But what I love about the job is that I have a voice. And more and more um, free expression and cartooning has been under attack in America and around the world. And for years it's been under attack around the world because there are authoritarian regimes that the first group they'll punish when they're gonna crack down on free expression will be cartoonists. And I've been involved in our national organization uh, as president, American Association of Editorial Cartoonists, and we have this um, other arm that protects cartoonists. Um, I mean, in China, and this is a cartoon that I drew sort of on free expression, how it's under attack. It says, this calls for retribution. You have China, we're cracking down on a poet. I mean, China's huge on, on all this. Iran, they've jailed artists, specifically in editorial cartoonists. Um, uh, in 2007, I believe, and, and in Turkey um, was the latest example of a cartoonist being in prison. And then at the end, it's Donald Trump saying he's calling for retribution for SNL, which is a form of satire, just like, just like editorial cartooning. But that's sort of how you begin when you start cracking down on this stuff. Um, but overseas, this has been an issue for decades. And now we're starting to see from a government standpoint, the first time in America, this crackdown on free expression. Um, 
here I have a cartoon on corporate um, censorship. So cartooning is also feeling it from the corporate side. The New York Times dropping editorial cartoons because they got too much blowback from a cartoon they shouldn't have printed. Um, so I'm just, you know, skewering them as a snowflake with everybody else. <clears throat> Let me see, I have one more slide here. So the final slide here, you're the enemy of the people, the First Amendment, he's calling the enemy of the people when he's chumming up, uh, getting chummy with uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, who is poison journalist, and Kim Jong-un, who's done worse. Um, so we are in a point in which free expression is the only thing we have to really fight injustice. And each of us has an, an, a powerful voice. And I think this is something we all fail to realize. We tend to sort of normalize everything, go through our day, <clears throat> and think everything will be fine, people are taking care of it. And I, we are seeing more people speak out. But I'm doing what I can because that's my job. But each of us, we can speak out whether it's going to a rally, uh, posting something on social media, um, telling a friend, hey, pay attention to this issue. And most importantly, the best way we can use our vo voice is to vote. And if we don't do that, everything that we stand for doesn't matter. Um, and whatever your issue is, whether it's justice, whether it's equality, whether it's uh, fairness for fair, fair housing, whatever you want, you need to speak up for it. And uh, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, is there are creative ways that you can speak out. Um, it's not always a typical way. So I, you know, I really encourage all of you to just find your passion and, and don't, don't lose sight of it and always speak out and vote, so.